my worst enemy The flesh that's covering me Brings me down to my knees Welcome to Sermons in the Park a ministry exploring biblical truth from the Word of God, focusing on the truths that help us in our daily walk with Christ in every aspect of our lives. Now, here is your Reverend, Jamie McCaskill. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all-new Sermons in the Park. As always, I am your Reverend Jamie McCaskill. This will be a video for Monday, September the 30th, and honestly, it was one that I was not going to do. I had everything prepared for it. I had my notes ready. Um, <clears throat> I've been having one of my Muslim friends who f apparently follows the channel commenting on one of my videos. The, the one recently I did on Muhammad. And he keeps going back and forth with me about uh, Gospels being uh, corrupted, if you will. Um, that's one of their claims that, you know, the gospel was corrupted. I talked about that a little bit before, but, um, yeah, I was not going to do this one. But since when I'm commenting back the, to show him how the Quran, well, you'll see when we get further into the video, because I brought up Uthman and we'll get into that. <clears throat> because one of the things that I've always found interesting uh, especially since I started looking into other religions, especially Islam, there are those in Islam who will argue with us about how the Quran is divine, right? Because they are, as they will tell you, there are no errors in the Quran, there are no alterations, there are no variations. We'll get into that because that's part of what the comment was that uh, YouTube, for some reason, keeps taking down. And... I hate to say this to all you Muslim friends of mine. The whole thing about the Quran not be having any errors and there being no alterations and no variations is not accurate. Sure, it might be true that the Quran that we have today, the one that's in my collection, the one that I'm pretty sure if you're Muslim, you have in yours, that Quran is a perfect copy of, of the Quran from the 7th century, right? For you to believe that every copy of the Quran is a perfect copy, word for word, of what was handed down by Muhammad, that's problematic to say the least. It has been historically proven. Do you get that? This is by historians who most likely most of them aren't even Christian that there were several different versions of the Quran that were circulated around Syria, Iraq, and yes, even Armenia. And this is before Uthman decided to make what he called the final revision. We have historical evidence that Uthman called in Zaid, you know Zaid, Muhammad's secretary, to oversee the final and definitive, or what you would call the authorized version of the Quran. And do you know what Uthman did after that? He burned every other copy of the Quran. Do you know why? That way, no one would be able to challenge his official Quran. As a, as a Christian, we can actually pull up the original documents of the Bible, but you can't look at any copy of the Quran that existed before Uthma. Think about that. If the Quran was, as you believe, perfectly preserved from the beginning, why did Uthman have to produce this so-called authorized version of the Quran? It's exactly what Alfred, I'm going to butcher his last name, Ghulam. He was the best known non-Muslim scholar of Islam, by the way. He said this, 
Only the men of Kufa refused the new addition, and their version was certainly extant as late as A.D. 1000. Uthman's addition to this day remains the authoritative word of God to Muslims. Nevertheless, even now, variant readings involving not only different readings of the vowels, but also occasionally a different consentational text, are recognized as of equal authority one with another. What that means is if you were to take the different translations of the Quran, sit down with them, study them, you will actually see that there is there are in different variants between them. These usually are just something like a, a letter out of place or even a vowel or a critical mark. But still, you cannot claim that it's in perfect unity, can you? Because you see, if you were to take in the English letter language right now and you were to delete a comma in a certain sentence, something like inviting grandma to have dinner with you can turn into you eating grandma. Do you see what I'm saying? And then you have to answer this one. If you're going to sit there and tell me that God has always been giving us revelations all throughout history, that would include the Psalms and the four Gospels as well, right? Then when you claim that Allah preserved the Quran miraculously, but at the same time you're telling me that Allah was not capable of doing the same thing with all the revelations before that. It makes no sense, does it? So let's do the same thing to the Quran that in the past I have done with other works, like the Book of Mormon and things like that, the lost books of the Bible. Let's see just how excellent the literary quality is. There is this well-known Shiite Muslim named Ali Dashit. He wrote this. The Quran contains sentences which are incomplete and not fully intelligible without the aid of commentaries, foreign words, unfamiliar Arabic words, and words used with other than the normal meaning adjectives and verbs inflected without observance of the concord of gender and number, illogical and ungrammatical applied pronouns, which in rhymed passages are often remote from the subject. There are other such aberrations in the language have given scope to critics who deny the Quran's eloquence. To sum up, more than 100 Quranic aberrations from the normal rules and structure of Arabic have been noted. And that's coming from a Shiite Muslim. Where did I read that? I read that in G. Allen and Wynn, 1985, on page 47. And I will note that down below if you want to go find it and read it for yourself. So, how can you claim that the Quran is flawless with all of these, as Ali Dashit called them, aberrations. And then you have things like the bad grammar. So, just like I did with the, with the Book of Mormon, let's look at prophecy, shall we? Because in all my episodes where I'm speaking of these texts, like I said, the Book of Mormon and things like that, I always mention how we should look at prophecy. Well, the Islamic apologists will always tell you how the Quran predicts that Muslims will be victorious at home and abroad. They will point to, and I will, I'm going to read from the Quran here. We're going to look at Surah 30 verses 1 to 5. It says, Alif Lam Mim. The Byzantines have been defeated in the nearest land but they, after their defeat, will overcome within three to nine years. To Allah belongs the command before and after, and that day the believers will rejoice in the victory of Allah. He gives victory to whom he wills, and he is the exalted in might, the merciful. Right, but you cannot say that this is a prophecy from God. You know why? 
because this is saying that the Muslims will be victorious militarily speaking, meaning their military is going to win. You have to stop and think. Muhammad's forces were huge. They were overwhelming. And this is not an impressive prediction anyway because of that. That's like going, I'm going to take 100 men, go kill five people. That's the word of God. It's prophecy. It's not. You've got 100 men, they're five. You're, you're going to wipe them out. Then there's the fact that in no time between this supposed prediction and the fulfillment of it, you will actually find some Muslims who will try to argue that what we're reading there is a, a, a victory speech that Muhammad gave before the battle to uh, boost the morale of his troops. When you compare the prophecies in the Bible with this supposed Islamic prophecy, it's not even close. Most of the prophecies that are found in the Bible were written hundreds of years before the event. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read you one of them. This is the prophecy concerning the birth of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrath, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of from a, I'm going to read it, I'm going to reread that, sorry. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrath, the, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, this is one that I always have fun with um, when I'm talking with friends or um, other Muslims that I meet in in person the scientific insights to start i want to read you a quote that i found in a book again this is from an is from a muslim islamic apologist i.a ibrahim um i found this in a work titled a brief guide to understanding islam when you read it he wrote this the quran which was revealed 14 centuries ago, mentioned facts only recently discovered or proven by scientists. This proves without a doubt that the Quran must be the literal word of God revealed by him to the prophet Muhammad and that the Quran was not authored by Muhammad or by any other human being. But, we want to know how valid that is, don't we? First, any scientist will tell you that just because something conforms to science, it doesn't make it divinely inspired. Right? That's not even to mention the fact that the scientific models are changing all the time. So they are not even an absolute gauge of what the truth is or what a lie is. Secondly, well, there are the highly suspect, let's call them supposed scientific statements that are in the Quran that um, these same apologists will then turn around and ignore. I'm going to give you a couple of examples here, okay? According to the Quran, human beings are formed from a blood clot. Oh, by the way, this was not something rare. This was actually uh, one of the old beliefs held by Rome at that, at that time. Scientifically, you and I know now that, well, that's just not true. So we're going to read the, ver the surah that says this. This is surah, chap surah 23, verse 14. Then we developed the drop 
into a clinging clot, and then developed the clot into a lump of flesh, then developed the lump into bones, and then clothed the bones with flesh. Then we brought it into being as a new creation. So blessed is Allah, the best of creators. Yeah. And then there's another claim that is in the Quran that says that, uh, pausing for effect, the sun sets into a spring of murky water. You know, the, so when the sun sets every every day, um, it's going down into a bolt, basically a, 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 a spring of water. It says, until he reached the setting point of the sun, which appeared to him to be setting in a spring of murky water where he found some people. We said, Ozul Karnain, either punish them or treat them kindly. So, as you can see, even if the claims were valid, you would have to say that there was no divine insight in it. And then we come to the historical accuracies, or let me say inaccuracies. Okay, so these are so long that uh, sadly I could talk about them for hours. So what I've done is I'm going to look at one. That's right. I found one that impressed me enough that I'm going to use it. This one can be found in Surah 20, where we read about the golden calf, you know, from no, from Moses. We're going to be looking at, we're going to be reading Surah 20. Um, we're going to read verses 85 to 88. And then just like I do with the Bible, sometimes I skip, right? So we're going to go from 85 to 88, and then we're going to skip to verse to verse 95. And this is what we read. He, meaning Allah, said, We have tempted thy people since thou didst leave them. The Samaritan has led them into error. Then Moses returned, and we cast them, the golden ornaments, as the Samaritan also threw them into the fire. Then he brought out from them a calf, a mere body that lowed, and they said, This is your God, and the God of Moses, whom we, he has forgotten. Moses said, And thou Samaritan, what was thy business? Okay. <laughs> Let me ask some of my long-time followers here. Did you see the issue, the problem? Well, you should. Because the Samaritans, it said that it was a Samaritan there. How could a Samaritan mislead Israelites during the time of Moses? Because that was around 1400 B.C. But the city of Samaria was not even established until at least 870 B.C. by King Omri. And the Samaritans as a people didn't come about until after the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered and then resettled in 722 B.C. by King Sargon II, who, by the way, brought in people from other nations. And it was these new settlers mixing their beliefs with the Jewish faith that created the blend of religions, okay? So the Samaritans, they didn't even exist. You know, more than 500 years after all that business with Moses. That one error alone shows you that the Quran cannot be considered as an errant work of God, as it, people claim. So after highlighting just a few, just a few, of the many issues that challenge the Quran as being divinely inspired, you have to question the claim of it being the perfect word of God to humanity. 
But when we hold the Bible, as I have done already here on the channel, to that same level of scrutiny, it stands strong. It proves itself to be flawless. And all of this video was even made, or episode was even made, because YouTube decided that a comment on my video needed to be deleted. Maybe my Muslim friend who was commenting with me, discussing. I wish, by the way, I enjoy talking with you. Maybe now you hear my answer. So thank you all for joining me here. I pray the Lord continues to bless and keep you, and I'll see you all soon. I love you. You have been listening to Sermons in the Park with Reverend Jamie McCaskill. Be sure to follow us on YouTube, BitChute, and Rumble. And as always, thank you for listening. There's joy for the morning, sinner be still. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't heal. So lay down your bed.